Well, welcome, Kevin. We're with um, Kevin Annett, the um, Secretary of the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State. And <clears throat> there have been some momentous events since we last had you here for our update. We've had the departure of one pope, which you have demonstrated was more probably than not. There's very good evidence was on the basis of the of, of the um, actions by the tribunal, and perhaps you'll explain that in, during this interview. And we've had the advent of a new pope, who's a Jesuit pope, mm -hmm. and a lot of anomalies there, and we want to hear about your plans. So why don't we start with the departure of the old pope and the role that the tribunal played in that. Well, yeah, it was quite interesting the way it all played out, Alfred, because as viewers probably know, for a number of years I've been working in Europe with human rights groups, lawyers, and even a couple of governments in Europe, showing and sharing with them our evidence, not only about genocide in Canada, perpetrated by the Vatican and the Crown of England and the other churches here, but also the direct links of Joseph Ratzinger, the former Pope Benedict, uh, to ordering the cover-up of these crimes. And the more notorious example is when Ratzinger on two occasions actually in writing ordered bishops in Ireland and in America to not disclose to the police evidence of child trafficking, not simply rape by individual priests, but actual child trafficking networks that exist within the Vatican. Uh, we know when the William Lynn, a bishop in Philadelphia, was convicted, that child trafficking by over a quarter of the priests in the Philadelphia Diocese was documented. So we had the goods on Joseph Ratzinger, and we were sharing that with various governments. Um, over the last few months, we've established a common law court case online, which people can view at itccs.org. And on January 30th, we concluded the case, uh, the presentation of the evidence showing these crimes of genocide by church and state. The, the verdict actually came in February 25th, and very soon after that, uh, one of the governments in Europe that we've been working with sent a diplomatic note to Cardinal Bertoni's office, the Secretary of State's office in the Vatican, claiming that they were planning to issue an arrest warrant on the basis of a court case that they had entered based on our evidence and other, other materials showing that the Pope was implicated in these crimes. Well, within six days of them receiving that note, uh, Ratzinger resigned. And it was directly because of that. We know that because recently... Um, just within the last three days, members of our network in Italy have actually delivered the verdict of the court and the citizen's arrest warrant issued against 30 of these, these defendants. And when they delivered it to the Swiss guards and to the Vatican Secretary of State's office uh, just two days ago in Rome, they were told by a very irate uh, a bureaucrat in the Vatican that, well, you've already done this to one pope. Uh, are you going to try this on, on uh, Francis I as well? So they themselves are acknowledging that they know very well it was because of that evidence that we brought out. And as for the, the latest pope, I mean, it was very interesting, not only because he's the first Jesuit in, in uh, papal history to occupy the throne, if you like, but his own uh, history is so tainted. I mean, he was an advisor to the Argentine military dictator Jorge Vadela in the 1970s, during the Dirty War that claimed the lives of over 30,000 Argentinians uh, as uh, Bishop uh, and then later Cardinal Bergoglio, Francis I knew of the death and murders going on in the jails of Jorge Vidal. He was offering him advice about how to improve his public image and he even knew that several of his own priests were who were involved with the poor in the slums of Buenos Aires had been captured, tortured, and were on the verge of being executed by the Argentine junta, he turned a blind eye and basically said, do whatever you want to these left-wing priests. Now, I mean, that and as well as the fact that he uh, was implicated directly in the kidnapping of the children of political prisoners and then trafficking them um, through the Catholic Church networks, as happened in Spain and many other countries, um, you know, all of this shows that this man is directly implicated in crimes against humanity. So a similar arrest warrant was issued for Pope Francis I by our court uh, on um, March 12th. And, and so, you know, these are standing arrest warrants that are good for a year. 
And there have been numerous attempts to, to uh, enforce these arrest warrants already, including in Canada. Right, right. So now uh, these events have happened so rapidly. So uh, what are your plans now that, that you have sort of this, uh, the, the Ratzinger Pope going, and now the, the Vatican bringing forth uh, Pope Francis I, the first, the first Latin American Pope from Argentina. He has this history with the, with, with the dirty war. He's now putting forth this image as the humble Jesus-like, yeah. Jesus-like um, uh, pope. That yeah. is, he's forsaken the the uh, the uh, <clears throat> papal throne. He's yeah. not living in the palace. He's uh, uh, washing the feet of the of the juvenile uh, of the juvenile kind of uh, halfway house people. Uh, he's called for a poor, a poor church. Is this an act? Is this kind of a Jesuit Jedi <laughs> move or what? Yeah, it's, it's uh, damage control. You know, it's like what any corporation does. They bring in the new guy. They do the spin operation, uh, hoping that people's three-minute memory will, will kick in. They're playing on the Oscar Romero image of the humble Latin American bishop. That's one of the reasons they put him in, for the public relations image. Uh, if he's sincere about turning the Vatican into the Church of the Poor, then I'm sure the first thing he'll do is sever ties with the Mafia, uh, disclose the real operations of the Vatican Bank, dis, uh, give away the property and the wealth, literally, of the Church. But the point is, it's too late for any of that. The, the common law um, order against the Church is that their property is forfeited already. Uh, and is to be opened as public space. You see, when an organization like the Vatican commits so many heinous crimes and is found guilty under the common law or under any court verdict, their property can be seized legally as reparations for the millions of people killed and harmed by the Roman Catholic Church. That's in the process of happening. There are already church occupations. I was just speaking to uh, Stimas, who's a Squamish elder here in Vancouver, who's in the process of seeking a lien on all Catholic Church property on his territory. So, as it happened uh, in 2008, another Squamish elder, Capilano, uh, issued a similar eviction order on the Catholic, Anglican, and United Churches in Vancouver. Stimas is going ahead and seeking that lien. So, it doesn't really matter what kind of PR spin or what kind of gimmicks uh, Pope Francis I does. Their property and wealth is already forfeited, and any citizen, citizen can legally claim that, especially the survivors of the, these horrible crimes. Uh, child trafficking, murder. Uh, you know, when you look at any example like the Magdalene Laundries in Ireland, where children were worked to death, literally, uh, with a full knowledge of the Vatican, and those gra mass graves there are being covered up the same way they are in Canada. I mean, gestures don't make any difference uh, to any of that. So I think, you know, this will be proven in practice over the next few years. Now, now that we're, uh, uh, I, I just might say that today is good is good good uh, good friday uh which is a high holy day in the in the christian uh faith uh what are your plans uh what are the plans of the tribunal now going into 2013 you've got uh various various defendants uh uh you've got the vatican the pope you've got the queen and, and in fact, uh, there was a former advisor to the Queen who just this past week uh, called for her to step down. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, it, and I believe also that uh, it was on the day, just within hours, of uh, Buckingham Palace being served with a warrant that the Queen, quote, uh, got her flu. Is that correct? That's, uh, it happened uh, the, day oh, the day before. Several of our members in London went to Buckingham Palace. Uh, now this had followed after the court verdict, the common law court verdict, that found her guilty on both counts of, of committing crimes against humanity when sh eyewitnesses saw her abduct seven boys and three girls uh, from the Kamloops Indian Residential School in British Columbia in October 1964. Uh, government records confirm she was in the country at that time. And uh, so on that count of personal involvement in the disappearance of those children, 
And the general fact that she's head of state, head of the Church of England, which helped set up these Indian boarding school death camps where, you know, 50,000 children died. Um, on both counts, she's, she's liable. And it was interesting, she decided not to leave the country like she was going to. She, on March 6th, she was supposed to be in Rome uh, for some reason. And she canceled that under this bogus uh, reason of having the flu. Um, and for the government to even suggest the monarch step down for health reasons, that's kind of a euphemism on their part that they're, they're getting rid of her. And, uh, you know, again, it's because the head of state is liable personally for crimes. Now, if you look up in the Criminal Code of Canada, it says that the crown can be held liable for tort offenses committed within Canada. And so, in other words, even under Canadian law, when she's committed that offense, which she's done against those, those 10 children, um, she's liable. And she can go to trial. Now, if she ever went to trial, the whole house of cards would come down because it would, the whole history of that, that secret war uh, against Indian people and against anyone uh, who were opposed to the crown or the Vatican, that would all start coming out and unraveling. So, yeah, they would get rid of her the way they get rid of uh, Pope Benedict. Um, so I think it's all an example of the power of the truth coming out through an independent legal mechanism like a common law court. Now... The third major defendant in the tribunal's actions, of course, was the government of Canada, mm -hmm. headed up by the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Stephen Harper. Mm -hmm. What actions? Uh, how? What actions have have warrants been served upon the? Harper government, what has been the reaction in that in that regard? Well, Stephen Harper was one of the 30, I call them the dirty 30, you know, the 30 defendants in our case. It wasn't just the Queen and the Pope, uh, Stephen Harper, the head of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the heads of the United Church, uh, the Catholic and the Anglican Church in Canada, and lower church uh, officials. All of them were found guilty, and the it's an open-ended arrest warrant, good for a year, until March 5th, 2014. And uh, not only can they be uh, detained, but, the, you know, um, all of their property, again, like I said, is forfeited. They, they have lost their authority. Now, when the head of state and the acting prime minister are declared criminals under common law, it means that there really isn't a legal bona fide system uh, operating in the country right now. We are uh, legally and politically uh, without rulers. Uh, other, you know, because if you say these people have legitimate authority, you're saying convicted criminals are at the are at the helm of the state. Uh, so it makes everybody have to step back and ask themselves, well, what are we going to do now uh, in that void? Uh, obviously, we have to fall back on um, the right of citizens to protect themselves. Um, the agents of the crown are act acting without authority now, and so it, it's an opportunity for people in Canada and around the world to say. What kind of authority do we want to operate under? How are we going to hold these churches and governments accountable for, for real crimes, genocide, you know, the, the disappearance of all these children? Um, it, it's significant, too, that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that the government and churches set up to, in, you know, whitewash their crime, those officials were named as well as uh, defendants in this action. So Murray Sinclair, John Malloy, the various TRC officials, they're liable for uh, arrest as well because they're involved in an act of obstruction of justice. They're not allowing eyewitnesses to talk. They're covering up the scenes of crime. These, uh, you know, mass graves that we've documented at 28 spots across Canada. So really the question now is what are citizens in Canada and elsewhere going to do with these arrest warrants? How are they going to act to make sure not only these, these crimes stop, but we get to the heart of, of what really is still going on, these, these, uh, these crimes continuing. Right. So, uh, how do you see now that the warrants having been served, what do you see as the action steps mm -hmm. in 2013 with regard to the Vatican and the Pope, with regard to the uh, British Crown, and with regard to the Prime Minister and Government of Canada? Well, you know, all along when people have tried this in the past, and, and a good example is when Splitting the Sky tried to perform a, an individual arrest of George Bush when he was in Alberta. When people try that on their own, we see what happens. What we need to do is we need a middle wheel between the big wheel of the state we're confronting and 
ourselves and our conscience. What that middle wheel is, is the existing police authorities. And what we are doing, and this has worked before, and I've been there when it's worked, we are attempting to deputize uh, the existing police forces, saying under common law you have a duty to defend our right to peacefully assemble and protect our communities against proven child rapists and criminals in office. And we've done that before. As a matter of fact, the best example is when we occupied the main Catholic cathedral in downtown Vancouver in the spring of 2007, actions which led directly to Stephen Harper's apology for the residential school crimes. Um, when the police showed up, we said exactly that. Under the authority of the Squamish chiefs, we said, we're asking you to protect our right to peacefully assemble within this church. We're not disrupting anything. We're peacefully assembling. The police consulted among themselves and withdrew. They didn't intervene in the situation. They didn't stop us from occupying that church because they knew we were on solid ground. We're doing the same thing. We've issued a notice to all of the police in these countries, uh, the United States, Canada, England, and Italy, where these 30 people are, all live. And we said, we need you to act to defend our rights and to enforce these arrest warrants. Now, if you don't do that, we will appoint our own common law peace officers to do that. So in effect, what we're doing is we're challenging the power structure directly, uh, either with the help of the existing authorities or with our own. And so really, it's, uh, it's a long process. It doesn't happen overnight, but we've broken the ice, we've given an example, and now it depends on whether people are going to act on that example. Now, now you had mentioned um, right after, uh, or right after first pope stepped down that you might be considering going on a speaking tour. Is that something that's still on? Or? It is, actually. Uh, uh, first week in April, I'm going down to the United States. I'm going to speak uh, in New York, and there's in fact a United Nations uh, conference on genocide where I'll be presenting the, all of the evidence on the um, the crimes of genocide in Canada. And uh, uh, early in May, I'm going from America over to Europe. I'll be in Europe for all of May and June, visiting nine countries and helping these groups take action on the arrest warrants and also put together upcoming cases in the dock of the common law court. For example, there's a case in, in the works uh, where we're looking at the ties between big pharmaceutical companies in the Vatican and their history of using children in orphanages and Catholic institutions as, as involuntary test subjects, um, in drug testing uh, programs, that kind of thing. So we'll be setting all that up, uh, helping lead actions, and in fact, um, going right to Rome again to, uh, to help coordinate a lot of this. It's also encouraging because the people in Paris have set up a new international um, blog site with all of our material and videos translated now into nine different languages. You know, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, German, Polish, Hungarian. I mean, they're going the, uh, all out in getting this into European languages. And you can find that at um, uh, it's kevinannettinternational.blogspot.fr. That's all up at um, itccs.org. So again, there's a, a real groundswell of we're now working now actually in 21 countries in the world. Excellent. Um, so, um, how can people watching this and their friends support the efforts of this of of the tribunal and this wave of citizen justice that is that is starting to spread across the planet well uh, do likewise I mean you know that we're setting an example not as an end in itself we're learning along the way I mean we don't have the the final answer written in stone here we're trying out something and it's hopefully a springboard by which other people can do the same thing around their own issues their own communities to realize that law is in our hands now because the constituted authorities of church and state and, and the court system uh, they're, they're, the, they're the problem. They are inundated with criminals. They're working to undermine our liberties, the safety of our children, um, the, the sanctity of Mother Earth. We're under assault, and it's a war for survival, and so we need to take back that power. So not just educating yourselves about what we're doing, but also setting up your own process, and we're seeing that's beginning. There's common law court action starting in America and England now directly based on the work we've been doing. And um, we expect those kinds of things to grow. So I would say to people, go to itccs.org, uh, our television network now, itccs.tv, 
And uh, also, of course, the genocide in Canada is documented at hiddennolonger.com. Now, could you talk a bit about the common law court process that is starting up in America? This is kind of a new effort uh, because we, we haven't heard about that before. Yeah, well, it's interesting in America because there's already that sense, unlike in Canada, uh, you, people already have that sense that um, they have an unalienable right to um, protect their communities over and against the authorities. Uh, we are in touch with a number of sh uh, sheriff's coalitions in California and Texas, sheriffs who've taken an oath um, to protect the, the rights of the citizens if the government brings in... Um, you know, their, their um, homeland security measures that are attacking the constitutional rights of Americans. There's the Oath Keepers, uh, active serving soldiers and policemen who are taking a similar um, oath to protect the citizens against the government if need be. And what's interesting, what's come out of that whole movement is this common law court effort. Uh, there's especially a group in, um, in the southern states, um, in Texas and I believe North Carolina, where they are, they've already established common law courts, and like we saw in England, um, they're actually annulling decisions of courts that are being declared un unconstitutional by the citizens. So, um, you know, this is, like I say, developing, I'm, I'm still learning about a lot of this, how it, it's, it's a different way they're going about it in America, but that's good. I mean, the, it's like in nature, the more diversity you get on this, the greater a chance of survival. So we need to keep learning from each other. But the important thing is to keep doing it and keep doing it vocally and publicly. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that a lot of the work we've already done is, is going to be an example for people. Yeah. Now, if people, especially in America or in England, want to get in, in contact with you to perhaps uh, talk about this, the common law courts of justice, how can they do that? Well, you can write to me, hidden from history one, like the number one, hidden from history one at gmail.com. And um, after uh, first week in April, I'll be on the road a lot, so that's the main way to reach me. But it's also uh, through um, ITCCS uh, Central. ITCCS Central at gmail.com is the main email site of, of the headquarters in Brussels of the tribunal. And uh, I'll be spending a lot of my time in Europe, so especially groups that are based there, are connected there, very important to be in touch with them because um, there's really too much now to describe. I mean, there's, um, uh, to give you just a, a brief example, there was a bishop, a Catholic bishop in New York State, actually, who decided to try to get the American bishops, and he's facing a, a, a prison term now for doing this, he actually went into a church in Albany, New York last week and began to speak to the parishioners there about the crimes of the Vatican and how American Catholics should consider disaffiliating from Rome. The, American, uh, the Irish bishops are, are just having the same discussions. Then this is phenomenal. This is, means that we're into another Reformation. There's going to be a split within the Church of Rome. And uh, for doing that, he was uh, uh, accused of disrupting a church service. They've got him now under uh, an arrest warrant. Uh, we're gonna. Uh, he doesn't want the details brought out yet until he can consult a lawyer. But this is an American bishop who's doing that, and it's and it's an example of the wave of change that's starting all over. And so um, it's a very exciting time. And I so I want to really urge people to strike now while the iron's hot, because when that kind of division is happening within the Catholic hierarchy, uh, you know that there's real changes underfoot and real discontent. Excellent. Um, are there any final thoughts that, that you'd like to live, leave, leave with our viewers? Well, I, I would just remind people, too, um, maybe you don't need a reminder that could be obvious to a lot of you, but this is a real spiritual battle we're engaged in. It's not ultimately about um, the obvious. You know, I think we're, we're engaged with uh, principalities and powers that have been enslaving humanity for many centuries. And we are now at a point of spiritually breaking free and mentally breaking free of this control we've been under. The church has been one of the main means of that control. And now its mask is completely slipping. And that's why we get so much pro-church propaganda in the corporate media now. We're tr they're desperately trying to hold on to the fact that the institution is crumbling before our eyes. With that crumbling, there's going to be a great release. 
and a great liberation going on in the spirit of humanity. And this is now the time to stand forth and to take courage and to act because there's many uh, spirits and, and forces that are on our side. And I learned that the first time I did an exorcism in, at the Vatican and the tornado hit the city the next morning. That was definitely a sign uh, that there's greater powers at work than we even realize. So I would just say to people, now's the time to take heart, stand in the truth, in love and in light, and we can't fail. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much for this update, uh, Kevin, and and we, we, we hope that you will come back to us from, from time to time as um, as events, as events with with the tribunal um, progress during this this coming year. I sure will, Alfred. I'll I'll keep you posted regularly. Thank you. Thank you.